There are only two days in the year when you can do nothing. One is yesterday and the other is tomorrow. This means that today is the right day to love, to believe, and above all, to live. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you at the screens with this quotation from the Dalai Lama. To those in the West, I wish you a good morning. To those in Africa and Europe, I wish you a good afternoon. And to those in the East, I wish you a good evening. My name is Georg Wenz, and I'm honored to welcome you on behalf of the International Association for Spiritual Care to this second day of our symposium. Before I turn the floor to Dominique Lodens, who will moderate today's uh, proceedings, I would like to take a few moments to um, offer some introductory uh, remarks. When I was a student, I was afforded to the opportunity to go abroad and engage in the study of Buddhism with a Japanese professor. This was a relatively uncommon occurrence at the time in Germany, even though it was also a period during which numerous Catholic monasteries in Germany and Europe were drawing inspiration from Zen Buddhism, offering meditations or meditation courses and designing their outdoor facilities in accordance with Zen principles. Politically, this period saw a surge in interest in Tibetan Buddhism, with many individual expressing solidarity with the Dalai Lama's government in exile and acknowledging the resilience of Buddhist monks and nuns. And finally, in the field of philosophy, parallels have been drawn between phenomenology and the work of Japanese philosophers like Nishida and Nishitani. And despite cultural and historical differences, both the phenomenological and the Japanese philosophies address comparable questions about human experience and the nature of reality. Three key insights from Buddhist philosophy have had a significant impact on my own reflections. The desire to overcome suffering, empathy for all living things, especially compassion with the suffering other, and thirdly, the deep understanding that everything is interconnected. There's a famous symbol and the symbol of interest net is particularly vivid in my memory. It's a wonderful metaphor for the interdependent nature of reality. Imagine a vast infinitive web that spreads out in all directions. At each node, there is a sparkling diamond. And these diamonds not only reflect the light, but also the rays of all other diamonds. This implies that every node, every existence, is in a constant and reciprocal relationship with all others. This image effectively demonstrates that our actions, thoughts, and feelings have a significant influence on others, affecting their behavior, thoughts, and emotions. In light of the above, it is reasonable to conclude that the term wisdom, prajna, is the most appropriate description of this insight into the unity, impermanence, and interdependency of reality. It is part of this wisdom that um, to identify the root causes of suffering and to discern yeah, the illusions that frequently impede or cloud our perception. As a result, there is not only this deep compassion for others' suffering, it also has a fundamental influence on the concept of spiritual care, a concept of spiritual care that places the individual in the context of all their relationships and motivates us to take action to alleviate suffering. I'm really looking forward to learning more about this today. 
With our second focus, we then will turn to humanism. My education at a humanist high school has instilled in me a particular understanding of the humanist concept of education. Humanist education encompasses not only Latin and Greek language and their influence on systematic and therefore critical thinking. It also includes a passion for philosophy, the commitment to personal and ethical growth, and a keen awareness of injustice and its complex underlying causes. The values of humility and altruism emerge, and they give rise to a profound sense of social awareness. This in turn gives rise to a sense of accountability or responsibility for others. In this context, the role of empathy and the ability to take oneself back are of particular significance, as they are in Buddhism. Furthermore, both traditions, the humanist and the Buddhist, exhibit another similarity that assumingly influences their approaches to spiritual care. Neither tradition refer to the existence of a personal afterlife. Consequently, the process of learning to let go, which is arguably one of the most challenging aspects of human existence, assumes fundamental importance. In this regard, both traditions call into question the current state of affairs, namely AI-based avatars of deceased loved ones that feign continued existence and exert considerable sway over the grieving process. In contrast, spiritual care represents a distinctive approach to providing support to those who are experiencing loss, be it a beloved person, be it one's own health, be it demen uh, dementia. It is designed to facilitate the acceptance of this loss and enable individuals to learn to live with it. In this sense, the today that the Dalai Lama speaks of becomes the foundation for a transformed life. Welcome again to our second day of our symposium. I would now like to hand over the microphone to Dominic Lodens who will moderate today's session. Dr. Lodens is currently the president of the Society for Intercultural Pastoral Care and Counseling. And uh, with this organization, the IEC has many points of contact. This symposium is the first official cooperation and we look forward to deepening it. Dominic, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Georg, for, uh, for your well-rounded introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here uh, on this uh, online uh, symposium. The program is very exciting. We uh, meet excellent practitioners, scholars, uh, and um, activists, community leaders, and I think this is a, a symposium in which all are involved. This is how I see the philosophy of the symposium. Not only the key speakers, uh, but uh, there are also the breakout sessions in which we can meet each other, uh, share each other's expertise and experience. And this is uh, practical theology at its finest, uh, where uh, interdisciplinary dialogue, intercultural, interreligious, interfaith dialogue is possible uh, and um, we are all invited uh, on this learning, uh, learning trajectory. We have a very uh, filled program today uh, and um, without further ado, uh, I would like uh, to introduce our two first uh, speakers. 
who come from uh, the Buddhist uh, tradition, identify with it, situate themselves within it. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Monica uh, Sanford. She is Assistant Dean for Multi-Religious Ministry at Harvard Divinity School. Her mission is to prepare a diverse cohort of students to become religious and spiritual leaders. She focuses on those who have historically been excluded from graduate level religious vocational education in the United States, such as Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu, pagan, spiritual, secular, and those who don't neatly fit into predefined categories. Her work extends beyond individual communities. She also prepares students for interreligious uh, settings. Reverend Dr. Sanford's expertise lies in both Buddhist chaplaincy across all sectors and college chaplaincy across all traditions. Her writings include Kalya Namitra, a model for Buddhist spiritual care. The title of her talk uh, is uh, Buddhist Practical Integrative Methods in Spiritual Care. Welcome, Monica Sanford. Our second speaker uh, is uh, Jai Hyang Padma. Uh, she serves as Associate Professor in the Wisdom Traditions Department at Naropa University. She is a language holder in the Soto Zen line of Shun Ryu Suzuki. She has served as a chaplain for 18 years, primarily within the field of higher education. Tihi Yang has a PhD in psychology with a specialization in transpersonal psychology. She is the acting president of the Maitreya Association, a Buddhist campus uh, chaplain association in formation. Her publications include Leaving the Season, Zen Practices, Living the Season, Zen Practices for Transformative Times, Field of Blessings, Ritual and Consciousness in the Work of Buddhist Healers, and a Sourcebook of Buddhist Campus Chaplaincy, which is in publication. Her research interests include engaged Buddhism, Buddhist practical theology, Buddhism and healing, interfaith dialogue, and chaplaincy. She is also a lifelong student of earth honoring traditions. The title of her talk is Medicine and Illness Cure Each Other Zen Practical Theology. A very welcome to you, uh, Jai Hyang Patma. And now I invite, invite uh, Monica uh, to uh, give her talk. Thank you for that very kind introduction. I'm going to share my screen. Can someone please give me a thumbs up if you can see that slide? Thank you so much, that's very helpful. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Monica Sanford. I'm coming to you from home, from Wakefield, Massachusetts. I apologize in advance if there are dogs moving in and out of the view. My talk is entitled Buddhist Practical Integrative Methods in Spiritual Care. Um, so I, want, I also wanna thank Dr. Skipani for inviting me to participate in this symposium and present on the topic that I've in previous uh, publications described as Buddhist practical theology in relation to spiritual care. I'm a Buddhist chaplain myself, as well as a practical theologian whose primary research focus is Buddhist chaplaincy and spiritual care, although I do teach and do research in multi-religious care and multi-religious settings. So today I want to cover two main 
topics with you, starting with a theoretical definition of our methods that I'm now calling Buddhist practical integration or integrative methods, and give you some examples of that method being employed. And if there's time, uh, might, I might conclude with a little bit of uh, reflection on spiritual care. So first I want to update some terms. As I've continued this work, I've sought to refine my language. What in earlier articles and chapters I referred to as Buddhist practical theology or practical Buddhist theology, I now describe as Buddhist practical integrative methods. For reasons I won't fully elucidate here, the term theology has always been an uneasy fit when applied to Buddhism. So I'm trying out this new compound, although it's something of a mouthful, um, I want to describe this work as Buddhist practical integrative methods moving forward and see how it goes. I use the term integrative to refer to a key dialogue that defines both this endeavor and the field of practical theology as a whole. The key principle in practical theology as described here by Bonnie Miller McLemore is this dialogue between our lived experience and our inherited wisdom traditions. So practical theology holds as a basic premise that theology emerges out of experience and practical theology has content not derived solely from historical and philosophical theology. Correlation, understood as a fluid dialectic between the human situation and religious message, emerged as an influential method and supported this claim and became a staple in the growth of practical theology. There is of course more to it than that, but this basic premise is easily acceptable to me because it's already found within Buddhist methods. It's not something I had to figure out how to fit within or adapt to Buddhism when I began my training as a practical theologian. The importance of integrating my lived experience with the inherited wisdom of Buddhism was already there. In Buddhism, we call this Dharma. So Buddhism has as its core always recognized that Dharma flows from two sources. The Princeton Dictionary's definition of Dharma, which goes on for a page and a half, makes this clear. That Dharma is a polysemous term. One of its most significant and common usages refers to teachings or doctrines, whether they be Buddhist or non-Buddhist, such as in the case of Hindu dharmas or Jain dharmas. A distinction was also drawn between the Dharma as or teachings as something that is heard or studied, called the scriptural Dharma or the Agama Dharma, and the Dharma or teachings as something that is made manifest in the consciousness of the practitioner called the realized Dharma or Abhigama Dharma. A second and very different principle denotation of Dharma is a physical or mental factor or a fundamental constituent element or simply phenomena. So when we hear that word Dharma in the scriptures, we have to discern whether they mean capital D Dharma, which usually means doctrine, teaching, or law, or if they mean lowercase dharma, which usually means phenomena or factors. In Buddhism, the historical Buddha taught the dharma but did not define or create the dharma. He discovered it within the experience of his life, taught it to others, and also taught that they too could discover exactly what he had realized. In fact, he taught that they must discover this realization for themselves, however much he could point the way each person had to awaken themselves. The title we give this great teacher is Buddha because the root of the term means one who is awake. Thus in Buddhism, you will also hear references to Buddhas, plural, the Buddha nature of all people that is the natural capacity for awakening. This is all related to the multivalent meaning of Dharma as a doctrine to be taught and an experience to be realized. When I began my pursuit of a doctorate in the academic field of practical theology, I was not yet aware of this key correspondence. What I knew was that this historically Methodist seminary and now multi-religious school would admit me to their doctoral program, knowing full well that for my dissertation, I intended to do a qualitative grounded theory study of Buddhist chaplains, a work that no Buddhist studies department I reached out to was interested in or would even allow. Thus, it was only a happy accident that I discovered this parallel in my first year seminar on practical theology, theology and was able to fully connect the academic discipline of which I was about to become a recognized member. Over the next few years, I would also complete my qualitative study of chaplains, which has been followed by similar studies and various publications and presentations on that topic. 
I'm going to draw from some of that material for this presentation. In addition to the parallel principle I just mentioned, I found a parallel method between Buddhism and the discipline of practical theology in the work of Richard Osmer. He proposed a method of doing practical theology based on a cycle of four tasks. Starting with the descriptive empirical task, we investigate what is happening. Moving into the interpretive task, we ask why is it happening? Third, we seek into the normative task to discover what ought to be happening, what should happen. And finally, we finish with the pragmatic task or the pragmatic strategic task to discern how we as either individuals or a community might respond. Of course, Osmer's four tasks are not as neat and linear as they're presented here. Just to describe something, we must interpret what we are seeing. When I teach this method to my Harvard students, I remind them that to interpret something, we must make a judgment about it. Normativity in particular tends to start much earlier than the third step. It's embedded in the way we describe a problem at all, or if we even characterize it as a problem rather than an issue or a concern. The choices we make for our interpretive lenses and theories also have normative valences, as do the pragmatic solutions we pursue. Our task as scholars and theologians is not to avoid this normativity, but to surface as many of our unspoken normative assumptions and biases as possible and assign them their proper significance. However artificial this breakdown seems, the four tasks as discrete actions force us as scholar practitioners to slow down, document our observations, think things through, and develop grounds for action that we can articulate for ourselves and for others who may be involved in whatever response is devised. Now these four tasks can be done by an individual, but they can also be done by a community. And in my teaching, we work through this method several times using concrete examples. There is a direct Buddhist parallel to Osmer's four tasks, although I have no reason to believe that Osmer was aware of it, and that's the Four Noble Truths. The truths are usually defined by their content, what they proclaim as truth. But if we look at their structure, we find the same method being employed. The first noble truth is the truth of suffering. All beings who live experience suffering, and it is describing what is happening within our fundamental experience of existence. The second noble truth defines the causes of suffering. It tells us why we are suffering. From a Buddhist perspective, we suffer because of desire, craving, and ignorance. The third noble truth defines the cessation of suffering, what ought to happen. We can become liberated from suffering through enlightenment, awakening, nirvana. And the final truth is the Noble Eightfold Path. This is a prescription for how one ought to live, how we respond to this condition of suffering in order to seek that path to liberation. If we combine these two models, we might get something like this as a result. A descriptive empirical task that focuses on the precise nature of the suffering being experienced in any given situation an interpretive task guided by a need to understand why that suffering is happening, a normative task dedicated towards liberation from suffering, whether in the form of Buddhist enlightenment or perhaps some more mundane outcome, such as the resolution of a conflict or a social response to racism or processing grief and bereavement. Finally, the pragmatic task can help us outline a way to reduce that suffering often by calling on the particular religious or spiritual wisdom of our care seekers to guide our response. This framework provides the method through which I approach my work as both a qualitative researcher, studying and writing about Buddhist chaplaincy and spiritual care, and as a chaplain myself, providing spiritual care in various contexts. As a researcher, I collect data from Buddhist chaplains in the field using interviews and surveys to get the best descriptions possible of what is going on. I then interpret the data using both social scientific and dharmic lenses. From both my own experience and the positionality of that of my research participants, I define a normative stance, something that could or should happen. And then I use the insights I have gleaned to offer suggestions of concrete steps that could be taken towards that goal. As I use this framework in my research, I also use it in my work as a chaplain, directly with spiritual care seekers. In that instance, I tend to use it informally as a mental model during care conversations, as well as formally as the basis of a Buddhist spiritual assessment method. 
The outline of the latter will be described in more detail in my forthcoming second book. In my first book, Kalyana Mitra, a model for Buddhist spiritual care, the first two chapters describe what a Buddhist chaplain is and what they do. The second chapter provides an interpretive framework called the three prajnas or three wisdoms. And the fourth chapter sets out the normative and pragmatic task, which is the chaplain's model of Kalyana Mitra or spiritual friendship as the basis for spiritual care. Um, I'm expanding that fourth aspect, the pragmatic task, in a second volume in the series. It will be Kalyana Mitra, a pra Pragmatic Responses for Buddhist Chaplains, Volume 2, which should be out by the end of this calendar year. Before I conclude this section, I just want to draw your attention briefly to another scholar practitioner who's examined the potential for Buddhist practical theology, Bhikshuni Lozang Trinle. I won't summarize her work that's on this slide for the sake of time, but both Bhikshuni and I were drawn to practical theology because the work it does is explicitly disallowed in Buddhist studies departments across Western academia, despite the benefit it brings to Buddhist communities and society as a whole. Bhikshuni advocates that Buddhism needs a practical theology because Buddhist congregations, clergy, religion teachers, etc., have the right to benefit from critical, normative, and pragmatic reflection on praxis. Her use of the term right is an allusion to the academic divide between religious studies and theology that makes it presently not feasible to do Buddhist practical theology research in academic religious studies departments. This work, she claims, will benefit full spiritual formation of their congregants and those who have this interest, like Bhikshuni and I, found refuge in Christian seminaries for our doctoral studies. The same conditions affect the ability of Hindu practitioners, such as those we heard from yesterday, and humanist and Islamic scholar practitioners, who we'll hear from later, to do similar critical, constructive, normative, and integrative types of work in the academy. So for now, I want to move on to some examples, let us look at two uses of the Four Noble Truths structured by other scholars and one alternative approach based on a Buddhist case method called Kwan study or Guang. So around the same time as I was training to become a chaplain, Trudy Jinpu Hirsch contributed a chapter to the Arts of Contemplative Care. This is the first anthology by and for Buddhist chaplains. Subsequently, Ruth King has written a lovely autobiographical chapter in the anthology Black and Buddhist, wherein she uses the Four Noble Truths as a framework to understand her own spiritual path in relation to Buddhism and anti-Black racism that she experienced and continues to experience. Finally, Shushin Peterson draws on an alternative integrative method, the Zen practice of koan study, to illustrate how case study methods have a long history in Buddhist traditions. Let's take a minute to look at how Hirsch uses the Four Noble Truths to structure her chapter in the Arts of Contemplative Care. First, she lists the Four Noble Truths and then likens them by analogy to the diagnosis, causes, cure, and treatment of a disease. She then provides a direct link to how the CPE students that she works with experience these truths in their training. First, diagnose the disease, she writes. In the hospital, Clinical pastoral education students come face to face with patient after patient. That life is suffering is no longer a simple idea, something to dwell on during seated meditation, but it is the actual nature of their lives. Second, she helps students identify its cause. There is a cause of suffering. The second noble truth takes on a fleshy meaning as the student explores along with the patient the spiritual suffering that comes from clinging to life and fearing death. Third, she helps to determine whether it is curable, the normative task. The cessation of suffering, the third noble truth, is an opportunity for the student to let go of their separateness and to experience the possibility of being at one with or intimate with each patient. Finally, they outline a course of treatment to cure it, the pragmatic task. The path is the fourth noble truth and was part of the inspiration behind the creation of the New York Zen Center of Contemplative Care. These students have courageously faced and embraced their patient's suffering and have allowed these emotional and rich relationships to guide, teach, and transform their lives as well. 
So the PATH is both the New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care itself, which is one of a small number of Buddhist-based hospices in the United States, as well as the skillful responses of the students to their patients, both in that hospice and in other settings. Another example of using the Four Noble Truths framework appears in the chapter by Ruth King, titled Wholeness is No Trifling Matter, Race, Faith, and Refuge, which can be found in the anthology Black and Buddhist, What Buddhism Can Teach Us About Race, Resilience, Transformation, and Freedom, edited by Cheryl Giles and Pamela Ayoyatunde. For the sake of time, I'm not going to walk through uh, King's example. I just wanted to share it here in case you'd like to see another place where this framework is being used for the purposes of practical theology from a Buddhist perspective. Now, the Four Noble Truths provide one paradigm of a Buddhist practical integrative method, but there are many more. Another I wish to draw out today is a Buddhist elaboration of the case study method that's been used in East Asia for several hundred years at least. In Japanese Zen Buddhism, this is called the Koan method. In Chinese Chan, it is called the Gong'an method, a word that means public record or legal precedent, as in a case. Shushin Peterson writes about koans in his chapter, reflecting clear moonlight when modern chaplaincy embodies a living koan, in the recent anthology, Refuge in the Storm, Buddhist Voices in Crisis Care, edited by Nathan Jishin Michon. Peterson is a Buddhist chaplain working with the VA in California. That's the Veterans Administration. So he's at a, veter he's at a hospital for veterans. He begins by citing a koan called, Master Ma was feeling unwell. Great Master Ma was feeling unwell. The temple superintendent asked him, Teacher, how are you these days? The Great Master said, Sun-faced Buddha, sorry, sun-faced Buddha, moon-faced Buddha. This koan is captured in a classic compilation known as the Blue Cliff Record, which is regularly used throughout Zen communities in Asia and North America as a teaching tool and the basis for Dharma talks. Peterson provides a reflection on the meaning of this koan from his perspective as a chaplain, noting that his encounters with care seekers, that in his encounters with care seekers, we chaplains might be either the moon or the sun. As the moon, we gently mirror back a patient's distress in such a way that it is no longer scorching. As the sun, sorry, that is no longer scorching, allowing the patient to directly engage with it. As the sun, we are gently illuminating a whole and complete human being who has been covered by the darkness of their suffering. In this work, Peterson tells us to use our own inherent Buddha nature, our innate capacity for wisdom, to mirror back that capacity within the person we are caring for. They too have access to the wisdom, insight, and compassion from within themselves that can help them cope with their current situation. Master Ma affirmed through his koan that this Buddha nature is in or innate sacred quality within everyone is unaffected by physical circumstances such as aging, illness, or injury. It is the role of a seasoned Zen practitioner to always be in contact with this nature, both within themselves and others. Peterson draws on the classical koan commentaries to integrate this with his difficult work of facing suffering in spiritual care. Quote, sun-faced Buddha, moon-faced Buddha, what kind of people were the ancient emperors? For 20 years I have struggled, how many times have I gone down into the blue dragon's cave for you? This distress is worth recounting. Clear-eyed Chan practitioners should not take it lightly. Peterson finds the commentary of this 10th century Chinese Buddhist monk valuable in his work today. Quote, to be capable of providing space where patients can reconnect with their own nature and work towards healing, requires a chaplain to have thoroughly delved into their own emotional and spiritual histories. To see ourselves as we truly are is very distressing, as Master Zuan Diao tells us. Unfortunately, if we do not embark on this journey of discovery, it allows all these buried wounds within ourselves to continue to be actively avoided or quietly ignored while they retain influence over us. To see ourselves as we are is distressing, because of how much of our Buddha nature we have forgotten, covered over, or lost touch with. 
We believe many delusions about who we are that clouds our ability to connect with and live into our Buddha nature. Piercing these delusions, delusions in the Zen tradition is often described as a painful but ultimately necessary process, like going through chemotherapy for the heart and mind. Because Zen practitioners have experienced this process, they are then also able to experience sitting with the suffering of care seekers, already knowing that blue dragon quite intimately. I should, um, sorry, have a little bit of a different expression here. All right, so I will conclude with a tentative and somewhat changing definition of what I mean by Buddhist practical integrative methods that I've just described. Buddhist practical integrative methods are a philosophical and methodological discipline within Buddhism that uses empirical description and normative construction to study the dialectical relationship between lived experience and the Buddha Dharma to understand and beneficially transform human activity. Why philosophical? Because it posits that our lived experiences illuminate the Dharma in unique ways based on our positionality and vice versa. It is not simply applied Dharma, nor is it simply about interpreting the Dharma to suit our present contexts. The Dharma challenges us to live differently and better and the way we live changes our understanding of the Dharma. The two meanings of Dharma draw us into an integrative process. Why methodological? Because we can apply the four task method implicit within the Four Noble Truths to study and solve problems in our world. This is one method among many. We can use other existing methodologies within Buddhism, such as koans or the three prajnas, or three wisdoms. These methodologies require both empirical description of what is really happening in real world situations and relies on qualitative methods from the social sciences to reveal what is going on. It also requires normative construction that is based in our understanding of Buddhist ethics, Buddhist psychology, community and personal values, and other principles to describe a path forward. What is a dialectical relationship? The root of the first term is dialogue or a conversation between two parties. The term dialectical means a form of conversation in which each party is coming from a different direction and building to a point of synthesis and resolution of seeming differences. A dialectical conversation discovers common ground where each party listens to and learns from one another. This highlights the philosophical understanding that Dharma is not simply a description sorry, that Dharma is simply a description of what is actually happening and therefore should be readily observable in lived experience. Doctrine and experience, while they can seem wildly different at times, are not fundamentally at odds with one another, but rather two ways of describing the same thing. Our goal as Buddhist practical scholars is to draw this out and explicate it in contemporary contexts. Buddhist practical integrative methods are thus dialectical rather than a dialogical operation. Finally, the role of this kind of work is to beneficially transform human activity. Yes, it also transforms human beings, but there is a fundamentally practical aspect to it that focuses on what humans do. The Dharma itself is a skillful path to inner transformation. Buddhist practical integrative methods, on the other hand, focus on transforming our outer activity, especially on a collective and communal level. How do we organize our communities? How do we conduct meaningful rituals? How do we engage with society? How do we build temples and altars? How do we provide spiritual care? How do we teach our religious tradition and practices to the next generation? These are all appropriate topics of study within Buddhist practical integrative methods. Thank you very much. Uh, for, there's a slide with some further reading if any of you are interested. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Monica, uh, for your very inspiring talk. What I take away from it, and it will also be interesting, I think, for uh, our conversation in the breakout groups, uh, is uh, that it's not self-evident uh, to speak about Buddhist practical theology, but that you offer us an alternative, uh, and you uh, give us the alternative of Buddhist practical integrative methods as a starting point. Uh, to avoid uh, this uh, concept of theology. And uh, another element uh, for uh, discussion and reflection 
uh, is uh, you referred uh, to the four uh, tasks uh, for practical theology, uh, something that is useful not only in research, uh, but also in uh, the practice of spiritual care in which you are both uh, involved. And uh, there is uh, an easy connection to make between uh, the Buddhism four noble truths uh, and the four tasks of uh, practical theology. And this brings up uh, the whole exercise of dialectic dialogue between uh, the tradition where you're coming from uh, and uh, the uh, practical theology uh, method that you presented. And you also referred uh, to the tradition of the koan, uh, which uh, needs uh, interpreted in uh, reinterpreted in today's context. Uh, so that um, the whole uh, uh, Buddhist community, patients, people that you work with uh, can profit from it in today's uh, challenging uh, context. So thank you very much. Uh, these are some uh, topics that I bring up that also uh, are an invitation for further reflection. And I now um, give uh, the floor uh, to Ji uh, Hyang Patma, uh, who will uh, pick up, uh, I think, uh, where uh, Monica stopped. Ji Hyang, uh, please go ahead. Thank you. I'm uh, going to pull up the screen share. Uh, so the the theme uh, that I've chosen for my presentation is coming from a Zen Buddhist koan. Uh, Monica has already well introduced uh, koans as a practical theology. And so um, the title here, Medicine and Illness, uh, Cure Each Other. Uh, is something I'm going to explain further as we go along. This uh, picture um, on the front is a picture of Vimala Kirti. Vimala Kirti in Buddhist tradition was um, very important. The Vimala Kirti Sutra is uh, uh, the first sutra in which we see someone uh, lifted up as a Buddhist teacher uh, who is a lay person and who is practicing within the temples of human experience. And so through the stories of uh, the excellent insight and action of Vimla Kirti, uh, we know that this uh, teaching can take place in, um, in any sphere. And so uh, there's a, some intentional overlap. Just to review, uh, the Four Noble Truths can be seen as a practical theology as well as a liberative theology. So the Four Noble Truths begin with the truth of suffering, which is diagnosing the issue, the truth of origination, which is locating the cause, the truth of stopping, which provides a cure, and the truth of the path, which is the treatment for the malady. And this really runs uh, parallel uh, to practical theology and to the, also to the cycle of liberative pastoral praxis, which is uh, described by um, theologian Leahy in the book In Living Color. Right. So we have on the one hand um, the concrete experience of suffering, and uh, then two, you know, we look at the origination of that suffering through a psychosocial exploration. The third is how the uh, process of stopping, uh, uh, described in Leahy as the standard and innovative responses. And then the, finally, the path, which is the response. And this liberative understanding of the Four Noble Truths is also reinforced uh, by Dr. Ambedkar's Buddha and his Dhamma, <clears throat> a historically important book, and by the Sarvodaya movement a nonviolent community building movement in Sri Lanka, which was um, largely inspired by Buddhist principles, as well as uh, Gandhian principles. So um, psychophysiologically, this experience of the path 
can be also seen uh, through mindfulness. And I'm going to kind of take a step out into the uh, behavioral sciences because I know that's also an important theme for this symposium. Borrowing a page from Daniel Siegel, we have here what he calls a handy model of the brain. So we can see here, if we imagine, uh, the wrist is the brain stem, the back of the hand is the back of the head. And um, here, this uh, part would be the limbic system. And then here where the knuckles are would be the prefrontal cortex. And what's really important is that we have enough information coming from the limbic system so that life has vitality, but not so much so that um, things become chaotic. So this middle prefrontal region here, just about the tips of the knuckles in, in this model, is, is crucial to carrying out the functions of a healthy life. So um, these two middle fingertips here are resting on top of the limbic system, which is the thumb, and touching on to the uh, brain stem, which is the palm here, and are also directly related to the uh, rest of the prefrontal cortex. So the whole middle prefrontal cortex is just one synapse away from the neurons in the cortex, the limbic area and the brain stem. And so it's serving in an uh, integrative function. The functions of this medial prefrontal cortex include the regulation of energy and information, attunement to others, emotional balance, response flexibility, fear modulation, insight, empathy, morality, and intuition. So these nine qualities of the medial prefrontal cortex can be considered the outcome of mindfulness meditation. As we practice mindfulness, uh, a kind of intricative um, experience is able to take place. It's so that we're holding um, the fullness of the body-mind with uh, clarity and discipline. And, and that process of mindfulness results in what is called vertical integration, um, an experience through which we're able to be present with the fullness of the body and yet have uh, that clarity and discipline of the mind. So those nine qualities of the medial prefrontal cortex are not only the outcome of practice, they're also the way of practicing mindfulness. We practice through attunement, through response, flexibility, insight, and empathy. Um, when, when education separated from the wisdom traditions that were Im embedded within religion, um, in some way, uh, sometimes we might have lost track of ethics, but there is the ground to claim a secular ethic of health which is based on this wisdom of integration. Uh, we all need a life of uh, empathy and a life of, of um, clear connection. So that, that quality of being able to hold space for our own experience internally is the same the same wiring and the same qualities that allow us to hold space for another as a chaplain or actually in all of our relationships. So when we practice an intervention as a, as a means of expressing connection, it can create spiritual transformation and healing. And also I would say psychosocial uh, integration. So this learning how to attend and to be with uh, parallels uh, the developmental psychologist uh, Winnicott's state of unintegration, which exists within our most essential early relationships. That capacity to be present just as a mother would be with her child uh, without interfering. 
Uh, the, the picture here is uh, taken from the Parliament of World Religions, um, which took place in Cape Town in, oh, I think 1999. And um, the, the monk in that picture is the Venerable Mahagosananda, who um, so uh, wisely and capably demonstrated to me uh, the capacity that we have as practitioners uh, to be present, as the Metta Sutra says, um, just as a mother at the sake of her own life would uh, watch over and protect her only child. So in that way, um, we can really consider the attachment theory to be a Buddhist uh, humanist theology. In early life, that quality um, of connection to a caregiver is processed through the limbic system, which is this implicit memory. It's unconscious because at the those first two years of early life, when those patterns are, are taking shape, the prefrontal cortex is not totally online. It's not totally developed yet. So those early impressions are stored through the implicit memory of the limbic system which receives the sensory messages and sends emotions, which are basically interpretations of experience uh, to the higher brain. And this is setting the template for all of our relationships, all of our later life relationships, our love relationships. Um, they're based on these unconscious um, implicit memories that are stored in the amygdala. And that includes our relationship to our body and to ourselves. Um, as we practice mindfulness, we strengthen connections between the limbic system and the cortex, which is known as vertical integration. In the presence of a person with whom we have developed trust, our mentor, our pastoral caregiver, friend, or spouse, we strengthen that sense of connection and security. Um, at any time in our lives, we can change uh, those early life patterns, uh, which are um, influencing our ability to make a healthy connection. And the, the name for that is earned secure attachment. So earned secure attachment is a basis in some ways for global health, our ability to have empathy, to have connection, um, to be able to hold space uh, for one another, to practice kindness. And um, this, this experience of integration and connection can be strengthened through our spiritual practices, uh, through our studies, and simply uh, through um, the wisdom traditions that have been um, embedded within the traditional cultures. This picture in the corner is a picture of a Tibetan medicine doctor uh, who is taking the pulse of a client. But within that relationship, even it is a practice of medicine, it is also foremost a practice of human uh, connection and mindfulness. So now, um, from there, segueing into the, the look at koans as a practical theology. And here's a particular uh, case study, a koan uh, that I would like to lift up. So Dung San's student asks him, um, you know, Dung Sung is unwell. So his student asks him, is there anyone who doesn't get sick? Uh, Dung San responds, yes, there is. The student says, does the person who doesn't get sick take care of you? He says, I have the opportunity to take care of that person. What happens when you take care of that person? At that time, I don't see the sickness. The deeper meaning of this is that our everyday body-mind with its imperfections is actually the growing edge. This transient and uh, vulnerable body is the alchemical container of our spiritual development. As Zen master Norm Fisher puts it, our strong Zen mind doesn't help us to transcend our illness. It is the other way around. Our human vulnerability humanizes and deepens 
our Zen mind. So the commentary, the traditional commentary on this case study uh, follows. Because of the illness of all sentient beings, Vimalakirti is sick. So this refers to uh, that original sutra, um, the original story of the lay person Vimalakirti, who um, upon getting sick, uh, all of the, the Buddha's disciples go to visit him together and ask, why? what's the nature of your illness? And he explains, uh, because all human beings are ill, then I am also ill. All human beings are ill with a desire, anger, and ignorance. Uh, so Vimal Kirti, though, as I, I mentioned, was a lay person who practiced in every situation. So he's famously showing us to seek enlightenment right where we are and not to attach to the reified idea of practice. So the commentary continues. Sometimes they compound medicine to heal the sickness. At other times, they manifest to heal the medicine. Um, if we fall into the weeds of delusion, the medicine of practice will help us to cleanse our perceptions, to realize that the world just in this um, uh, literal way that it's showing up is not all that there is. And at the same time, if we fall into the weed of delusion, the medicine of um, the world will, will cure us of that. If we get too attached to this uh, traditional form of the Dharma, the teaching, um, the tradition, that's where um, the the beings like the Imakirti manifest to heal the medicine. So in this Sutra of Vimalakirti, there is a Shariputra, a traditional a disciple of the Buddha who's uh, like a, a, in this sutra, he's shown as a little bit of a Dudley do right, right? He's a little bit too attached to the form of the teaching. And um, within that uh, sutra, this goddess shows up and dialogues with him uh, to help him uh, to cl cleanse that perception. So in this commentary, it says the great earth and all its multiplicity of forms, including you and me, are at once medicine. At such a time, where do you find yourself? So the great earth and all of its forms are medicine. The great earth and all of its forms are not separate from Dharma. So here's another koan uh, that breaks through the wall of the traditional dharma to remind us that this teaching is, is found everywhere and it needs to be, it needs to be that dynamic. So in this, in this um, particular case study, a monk goes to go call on a teacher, Mihu, a woman teacher. So the monk asks her, do you have any disciples? She says, yes, I do. The monk says, where are they? She says, the mountains, rivers, and earth, the plants and trees are all my disciples. The monk says, are you a nun? She says, what do you see me as? He says, a lay person. The woman says, then you can't be a monk. The monk says, you shouldn't mix up Buddhism. She says, I'm not mixing up Buddhism this way. The monk says, aren't you mixing up Buddhism? She says, I'm a man. Sorry, I'm a woman, you're a man. Where has there ever been any mix up? So that's really referring to finding practice right where we are. Um, not to hold on to a sense of the forms of practice, the reified tradition of the practice but to find the practice right where we are and to realize that um, the natural world, um, you know, and the simplicity of it, that's already uh, the medicine, that's already the teaching. So that, uh, uh, my own commentary on that, even though gold dust is valuable, if it gets into the eyes, it obstructs the vision. So one of uh, the a question I would lift up to the, both the uh, practical theology community and to the Buddhist community is, 
are there any places in which the teaching has become like that old dust um, in, in that in which we have got a bit too caught up in the traditional forms and need to breathe new life into it by adapting it uh, to the particular needs of the place and time where we are. So this is a traditional um, sculpture of the Buddha's birth. Um, you know, the Buddha got enlightenment under a tree. He was born under a tree. My teacher Zen master Sun San would say, go ask a tree. If you have a, a question, the tree will give you a good answer. So returning to this original koan, to, to say the great earth and all of its forms, including you and me, are at once medicine. Then at such a time, where do you find yourself? So how do we source from these teachings that are within the trees or within the natural world? You know, in, it, if that is the case, then how are we going to present the Dharma? You know, where are we going to find the live words for the Dharma? Another traditional case study. Su Tan Po, the poet, traveled across China to seek the Dharma. When he finally arrived at the temple, he asked the teacher, please give me the Buddha's teaching. Show me the truth. Open up my ignorant eyes. So the teacher shouted at him, how dare you come here seeking the dead words of men? Why don't you open your ears to the living words of nature? He said, go away. So Su Tung Po was shocked. He staggered out of the room, totally absorbed. He asked himself, where do I find this teaching that nature can give that men cannot? So he got on the horse and let the horse find the way home. On the way home, they encountered a waterfall and he, his mind opened. He understood he and the whole world were not separate. And then in the morning, he wrote this poem. The stream with its sounds is the Buddha's voice. The looming mountain is the earth's wide awake body. Throughout the night, song after song, how can I speak at dawn? So two centuries later, Zen Master Dogen wrote, sounds of streams and shapes of mountains, the sounds never stop and the shapes never cease. If you who are valley streams and looming mountains, can't throw some light on the nature of ridge and rivers. Who can? You know, so there, there is this awareness that we're already one um, with the, the original body of the Buddha, you know, the, the Dharma, which is the pure emptiness that is created as form. Uh, to quote Angelus Celestis, becoming substance, light and stillness, the substance and the storm. So the, the question really is, I think, um, how, do we, how do we really evolve practical theologies to support the healthy communities and ecosystems that are so urgently needed in this particular time? Uh, as Peter Senge uh, writes, a necessary revolution. We need to live in the present in ways that do not jeopardize our future. The future is awaiting our choices. This transformation takes place step by step through small things. We need to return to nature, not machines, as our source of inspiration. We need to build a regenerative society that mimics nature. We are called to an ecosystem awareness of each other. What we are after is the transformation of consciousness expressed through reaching out in the spirit of truth, warmth, and love. And uh, the Zen teacher and poet Gary Snyder wrote, 
To change the way contemporary human beings live on earth is a kind of Dharma work, a work for dedicated followers of the way who because of their practice and insight can hope to balance wisdom and compassion and help open the eyes of others. You know, so we have to leave uh, the, the uh, formal uh, monastery and we have to step away from um, reifying the sutras and step out into these temples of human experience, which currently are filled with suffering. And as we do, then we can see that the whole world is medicine. Uh, so some of the the, um, the practices that I've seen that have uh, this particular last weekend, uh, my T Tufts University students uh, took a weekend to go off the grid at Temenos Retreat Center in Shutesbury, uh, Massachusetts, you know, a, a weekend off the grid in the woods is actually logistically a little bit challenging uh, to organize, uh, but that is something that really helps the students to move from the isolated, um, lonely I to the interconnected and resilient we. Um, we have done um, some good work in taking refuge together, and in that way, reconnecting with the truth of our community. And not only the truth of the community as it exists in uh, this particular place through the many bodies of the Sangha, but also um, connecting in time, across time, to all of these uh, generations of practitioners who have taken refuge in that way. Uh, we use percussion and chanting, which are practices that actually support the vertical and horizontal integration um, that is described through neuropsychology. Percussion and chanting activate uh, the limbic system. And as we do that chanting, um, the prefrontal cortex is helping to make meaning of it. We don't uh, actually think about that vertical integration when we're doing it. We just do it and then the shift happens. Uh, Joanna Macy's uh, practices of adapting the four immeasurable teaching uh, to uh, group work as a way to help people to see uh, the loving kindness, uh, sympathetic joy, compassion, equanimity within each other is a practical theology. Uh, Roshi Joan Halifax has a grace model for cultivating presence, which is very beautiful and clear. Um, uh, Monica Sanford and other people have well developed the model of Kalana Mitra, uh, the spiritual friend, as it applies to chaplaincy and pastoral care. Uh, my uh, colleague in Princeton has done a, a program called Invisible Chaplains, through which students nominate people who across the campus, often in the uh, uh, the guise of a staff person, uh, someone who works in the cafeteria or as a janitor has been really present to them. And in that way, that lifts up uh, the truth of our connection, uh, the truth that this work is happening everywhere all the time. So um, I'd like to open it up if we can, if we have any, any moments to questions or comments. And um, like Monica, I have one more page, which just shows uh, a couple different uh, of the resources which have um, been sources of inspiration. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. It's a pleasure to share these ideas and to be part of this international community of practitioners. Thank you very much, uh, Ji Hee Young, uh, for your uh, very uh, inspiring presentation. Uh, some uh, things that I take away from it um, is that um, as a person who I myself um, been trained in the Christian tradition and in Western authors, uh, you give us the possibility to 
to get into connection uh, to your own approach, uh, thanks to referring to the behavioral sciences and also uh, to uh, liberative uh, pastoral practice, Emmanuel Larty, for example. Uh, and you also refer uh, to uh, the traditions of nonviolence uh, and the practice of uh, mindfulness. And one uh, very intriguing concept that was brought up for me and was new to me was uh, the, uh, the topic of uh, vertical integration. Uh, and that could be a, a very interesting topic uh, to, uh, to discuss further also in uh, the breakout groups. What does uh, vertical integration mean for me as a practitioner? How can I relate uh, to it? How can I be uh, inspired uh, by it? Uh, and another uh, quote that I wrote down uh, that is, seems to be very important for you is the idea that we have to practice right where we are. And then we also uh, can uh, see a connection to, uh, in a different way, uh, to the communities where we are situated in, to the ecosystem uh, where we are situated in, and that we don't uh, rely only on traditional forms that you described sometimes as uh, old dust, uh, but that when you are really and practice right where you are, then also these traditional forms uh, can be uh, um, build up a new practice uh, anew. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I invite, uh, this is the philosophy um, of uh, this uh, seminar, of this symposium to write down your questions uh, so that uh, also you, Ji Hyang, uh, can have time uh, when you write things down, you, um, uh, then you can reflect on it and uh, have a response uh, uh, to it. And also uh, uh, as a preparation uh, for uh, the publication. Uh, and I have seen that uh, in the chat, some interesting discussions uh, have been going on. Uh, again, uh, bro uh, broadening up uh, the perspective uh, where the question has also been asked about African traditions, about uh, people uh, who have uh, mental problems and uh, Buddhist uh, chaplaincy and other questions uh, that uh, popped up. So thank you very much, uh, all of you here present for the engaged uh, discussion here. Uh, we uh, now uh, will go uh, into the breaking, uh, the breakout groups, uh, and uh, uh, in your breakout group, uh, you uh, can also decide maybe to take first a short break or do the break uh, at the end. But please take uh, the opportunity to meet um, colleagues from all kinds of backgrounds, from different continents, just to have a little chat uh, with them and uh, agree as a group how you would like to proceed. And maybe you want to discuss some of the topics uh, that uh, I remembered, but I'm sure that you also have your own thoughts, associations, reflections uh, to uh, what our bold eminent speakers have brought us uh, today. So I wish you very good conversation. I wish you uh, a good uh, break uh, and we will see each other uh, in uh, half an hour. Thank, thank you uh, again, Ji Hi Yang and Monica. Hi, Monica. I, hello. Um, Hi, I don't, sorry, Steve. I didn't know if it was normal to answer in the chat. Oh, and, and that's fine. Sure. I just wanted to make sure that if, you know, if it's too distracting or whatever, um, I was also answering the, the people in the chat just to let them know that uh, I will make sure that you get these questions um, and then you can in the, either in the, um, 
what's posted online afterwards. If you want to add something to your um, slide deck or if um, in the publication that follows, then you can you can take a look at some of those questions. Um, so, but yeah, I just wanted to make sure that you didn't have to feel that you had to give a full uh, answer to these questions that were happening sort of as a side conversation. Yeah, and and Ji Hyung was already answering some of them in her talk. So I, I felt like I was maybe by answering them, distracting people from listening to her, but, um, yeah, I'm I'm always happy to answer questions when they're asked. But great, yeah. I'm Lovely always... talk, to you. Yeah, <laughs> no, thank you. I'm I'm glad to be your uh, follow up. It's a that's a, a gift of the universe for me. So I'll just write an email to you, Monica, with the all of the questions that I copied out of the chat. Okay. I will join one of these rooms or will you put me in one of these rooms?
Hello, James. Hello, Steve Norton webinar host. <laughs> yes, everybody else is um, in their breakout rooms right now. And the they should. Time. Yeah, they should be coming back, um, I think, shortly before 1015, so about 1010 or so. That's all good. I, I want to make sure that everything's working and that I can be heard okay and that yep. all, it's all good. Yep, sounds great. And that I look glorious. That's the most important thing. Oh, absolutely. How are you doing, Steve? Where are you right now? Very good. Yeah, I'm in Elkhart, Indiana. Ah, I haven't been to Indiana for a long time, and I don't think I've ever been to Elkhart. I'm not sure that you've missed very much, um, <laughs> but it is what it is. I'd much rather be in, in England. You say that. <laughs> England's great. It has many charms, and I'm very happy to be home. But it's also it, it also has its challenges right now. It's an expensive place to live. <laughs> oh, very true. Very true. That would be the one one thing that I would say about Elkhart, Indiana. The cost of living is not so high. So the the rent is not too high. Wow, that must be a correct. Fun. Yeah. Can I check that my share screen works very briefly while everyone's out, just to get that? Sure, out? sure, absolutely. I believe I made you co-host, so yeah. you should be able to um, share. Great. And then I can resize my little screen size so it's proper. I have a very particular way I like to do this. There we go. Great. Thanks. That's all working? Yep. Looks great. Then I'm all set. That was easy. I thought that okay. would be Hey, we, we like it when it's easy. I've done a lot of these. Gives me flashbacks to COVID and all the stuff we had to go through to get through that. Right, right, yeah.
Uh, Steve, are people still arriving or? People should be pretty much back. Um, everybody knows that uh, at about 10, 15 uh, Eastern time is when it will start. So okay. there will still probably be a few people coming yet. Okay, so we will still take this uh, three minutes break. Hello, Daniel. Good to quotes meet you. Yeah, good afternoon. Good to see you too. I was about to actually to greet you. <laughs> I'm glad you could make it. Very glad. <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure. So, um, yeah. Now, we... uh, uh, James, what is the title of your talk? Who knows? Let me check. Let me check what I decide to call it. Oh, okay, I, that's I good. was extremely <laughs> creative. I called it humanist spiritual care. Oh, okay. wasn't that great? <laughs> I really, I really dug deep for that one. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> good. Good to have you here. It's a pleasure. How are you doing? I'm fine. Uh, and they, and you have company. I can see some two little ears pop up. Ella comes to work with me often, and she's basically the center of my pastoral care practice. She 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 does most of the work for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Mute myself. Uh, dear colleagues, um, we were delving. Uh, and dialoguing uh, with uh, our Buddhist uh, colleagues. And now we are going to focus on the humanist uh, tradition. And it's great that we have uh, three speakers from, uh, I would say, um, yeah, three different countries uh, from the Netherlands, from the UK, and from the United States and Puerto Rico. Uh, so this is great that we can look at uh, the humanist tradition from these three locations. Um, and, and I'm uh, very happy to introduce our three speakers. And being myself from the lowlands, uh, from Belgium, um, it's great to introduce to you Carmen uh, Schumann from the Netherlands. Uh, who is uh, assistant uh, professor at the University of Humanistic Studies in Utrecht. She holds a PhD in mathematics from the University of Leiden in the Netherlands and worked as a researcher in the field of algebra algebraic geometry at the University of Essen, Germany. She is not going to say anything, I think, about this topic today. <laughs> And as you notice, it was already difficult for me just to pronounce it. I'm not having it uh, in my vocabulary on a daily basis. So she switched, which makes it very interesting, from mathematics to human, uh, humanistic studies. Uh, she worked for several years as a prison chaplain. Dr. Schumann specializes in spiritual care and chaplaincy in post-secular contexts. Her research interests include the relational and social uh, political dimensions of meaning in life and spiritual care, moral injury and moral resilience, and chaplaincy in the military and in 
financial uh, institutions. The title of Carmen's talk uh, is Humanist Wisdom Traditions in Interfaith Spiritual Care. Very uh, welcome, Carmen. Then we go to uh, James Croft, who some of you already uh, saw with his uh, assistant or her, uh, is she she or he, I, I'm not sure. Uh, he is a university chaplain and lead faith advisor for the University of Sussex and is the first and currently the only humanist to lead a chaplaincy at any UK university. Formerly as senior leader of the Ethical Society of St. Louis, uh, he led one of the largest humanist congregations in the world. And James says that his assistant, Ella, is a she. Uh, so James holds a doctorate uh, in, uh, and an M EDM from Harvard Graduate School of Education and an MA from the University of Cambridge. James has dedicated his life to helping uh, people ask the big questions. Why are we here? How should we treat each other? Where are we going? He is a popular speaker on matters of religion, ethics and philosophy in the UK and internationally. And you notice also in his international educational background that he has been all around. And the title of his talk uh, is, of James' talk, is Humanist Spiritual Care. Very welcome, James. And then we go to Anthony Cruz uh, Pantojas. He is a scholar uh, and ethicist who serves as the humanist chaplain and coordinator of Africana spirituality at Tufts University. Currently a PhD candidate in cultural studies at Universidad Ana G. Mendes, Gudabo, Puerto Rico. Cruz Pantojas earned master's degree in theology, theological studies and leadership studies. Through curated transformative experiences, blending art, spirituality and community engagement, Anthony fosters a creolizing approach to existential care and life exploration. Grounded in the Afro-Caribbean humanists and free thoughts philosophies, they promote critical thinking, and self-discovery, inspiring individuals to question and reimagine their inner, outer worlds. Anthony will introduce himself even more in his presentation, how he situates himself. The title of his talk is Inner and Outer Worlds, Caring uh, for Self and Others. Please uh, welcome our three speakers who come from the humanist tradition. And we start now with Carmen uh, Schumann uh, from Utrecht in the Netherlands. Wow, thank you so much, Dominique, for this beautiful introduction. The biggest challenge is coming now, whether I will be able to show you my presentation, see whether that works. Yes. Uh, yes, yeah, something, but now I still would like it to be a... A uh, dia voorstelling. Exact. Um, from the beginning. There we are, yeah. So, um, humanist wisdom traditions in interfaith spiritual care. Well, the picture you see here is the picture from the university where I am actually inside right now, the University of Humanistic Studies in Utrecht in the Netherlands which um, has been around for quite a few decades. So since 1963, there exists a training institute for humanist chaplains. So chaplains, the, the specialist spiritual caregivers, and this has become a university since 18, uh, 1989. So it's quite something special, I think. Uh, the Netherlands has a unique and long history of um, educating and uh, humanist chaplains and of humanist chaplains working alongside chaplains from other backgrounds. 
So I want to address two questions in this uh, presentation. First of all, how may we understand humanism as a wisdom tradition and even a wisdom tradition that invites interfaith collaboration in the context of spiritual care provision? I guess we wouldn't ask this question for many of the uh, world religions, but in the context of humanism, you might ask yourself, what kind of wisdom tradition is this actually? And the second question I will only briefly discuss is, well, may, and if yes, how may spiritual caregivers draw from psychotherapies, humanistic, secular psychotherapies or counseling approaches without losing the spiritual? And I will just touch upon that, I think. Um, Okay, so let's start out with the term humanism. Let's first delve into the first question. How can we understand humanism as a worldview tradition? And then the term humanism might be pretty confusing because it has many different and sometimes even conflicting meanings. And it's also a term that only um, has been around since, uh, since the 18th century, not before. So we very often use the term humanism post hoc to describe historical phenomena, which at the time were not labeled as humanism. So that's an important first uh, um, uh, thing to, 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 to hate, I would say, an important first statement. And then, if we look into um, the book, which I put up at the left, what is humanism and why does it matter? One of the contributors writes, well, humanism, it appears as an ideology, a theology, an anthropology, a philosophy, a psychology, a polit politics. So in short, it is many things and no single thing. So I would say it, it makes sense to first think a bit deeper about the notion of a, a, a wisdom tradition. And I will also use the term worldview in this context. So first, I want to tell a little bit about what I think is important when we talk about wisdom traditions. And here I draw from the work of the anthropologist Clifford Deers, who writes about religious, religions. And I think if we broaden that idea a bit, we can say that wisdom traditions are the kind of frameworks that provide people with some kind of orientation in life, with some sense of being in a good place or going in a good direction. And they do so especially in limit situations. So in particular, when we are confronted with difficult situations where we do not feel that we are in a good place, or we are going in a good direction, I think wisdom traditions have the power to still offer us some kind of orientation in life, some kind of sense that, well, there is some goodness still around. Not all good is lost. I guess that's what a wisdom tradition should be able to offer. It should offer stories or practices, etc., or ideas or ethics that give us a sense of goodness even in the face of these kind of limit experiences and Geertz um, distinguishes three kinds of limit experiences which we all know I think uh, a sense that the world has become incomprehensible uh, the confrontation with suffering facing suffering uh, and the confrontation with evil these are all situations where the notion that we are in a good place in life may get lost. And I would say that any kind of wisdom tradition therefore involves a notion of spirituality in the sense of an understanding of ultimate goodness, goodness that even makes sense in these kind of limit situations. Wisdom traditions always involve a notion of transcendence because this ultimate goodness is not the ordinary goodness that comes with not facing suffering, not facing evil, but it's a goodness that goes beyond these limit situations. And there it comes, I think wisdom traditions always involve a kind of faith, which I would not um, uh, just um, uh, say that faith is always um, religious faith. It may also be non-religious faith, the faith that 
one may make sense of life even in the context of these limit experiences. And what this means is that if we want to understand humanism as a wisdom tradition, we need to talk about humanist spirituality, humanist transcendence, and humanist faith, I would say. And I would say that spiritual care is precisely the kind of care for processes of orientation in life, especially in the context of these kind of limit experiences. I, I guess that is what spiritual care is about. So when we talk about humanism as a wisdom tradition, we also have a problem because there's quite some critique on humanism, which is very legitimate critique, which has come up over the last decade. So I just want to at least mention these First, there's the critique that humanism promotes a very Western-centric view of being human, that it is located in Western uh, enlightenment and in a sense contributes to oppression, to marginalization, and to promoting the Western view of life. A second point of critique is that it promotes an individualistic view of life and a very anthropocentric view of life. Uh, and the third point of critique is that humanism is anti-religion, that it opposes the view that it has contributed to sort of um, pushing out religious traditions, at least in Western societies. And I think these are legitimate critiques which oppose the idea that humanism might be a wisdom tradition. And I just put up certain authors, certain books that have uh, worked with these critiques and show that humanism is something that is evolving and taking into account these critical ideas. Critical Humanism, a beautiful book by Ken Plummer, the book by Anthony Penn about black humanism and uh, the, the importance for humanism to take into account the non-Western humanist traditions, and the book by Connolly about entangled humanism. So humanism, uh, starting from a view of the human as entangled in the world and in natural and cosmic processes. I wanted to mention the critique beforehand, because if we really take a very narrow view of humanism as Western-centric, individualistic, anti-religion, we won't get to an idea of humanism as a wisdom tradition that is helpful for providing humanist spiritual care. So I would say a starting point for understanding humanism as a worldview or a wisdom tradition would be to maybe not talk so much about humanism, but rather about humaneness, about humanity, about humanization. And then humanism would always involve an effort of engaging with the world as it presents itself to us in an attempt to promote humanization and to always counter dehumanization starting from the idea that being human means on the one hand that we are very vulnerable and fallible beings and we cannot wish that away but on the other hand we have this immense creative and moral potential so we are uh, human be as human beings we are always trying to find a balance between we are ver very vulnerable and fallible and always again, our projects will lead to dehumanization, to oppression, etc. But on the other hand, there is this counter force. We are creative and moral human beings and we can always try to counter dehumanization. I want to go to um, the Netherlands now where there has been a lot of thought about um, humanism as a worldview, especially by Jeb van Praag, who is the founding father of humanism and humanist chaplaincy. And just a few of his notions, he says humanism has to do with cultivating existential resilience, never blindly following prevailing, potentially dehumanizing visions, but cultivating resilience against that. It focuses on the interpersonal potential. And I put up a beautiful quote by Jaap van Praag, which involves the notion of belief. Often the seemingly impossible becomes possible if there is someone who really believes that the other is capable of it. So human, the human potential unfolds itself in between human beings, in communities, in relationships. And then another really important issue 
There are no final answers in, in the humanist worldview. We never have final answers to the big questions in life. And we always, again, need to, to be in dialogue with people who have other ideas than we have. I also wanted to present you the notion of inclusive humanism, which was um, thought out by Peter Derks, who was one of our professors at our university. Um, he focuses, he, what he says is that the fundamental humanist values are very often and generally shared with other worldviews. If we talk about human dignity, human solidarity, equality, tolerance, they do not belong to humanism. They are humanist values that we share, that we find in all kinds of other worldviews. So I think this shows how understanding humanism as a worldview um, can open up the dialogue and the connection with other worldviews. Um, I now wanted to say a little bit about humanist spirituality, humanist transcendence, and humanist faith. And then I end up with a little bit of the therapy stuff. So humanist spirituality, very short, just some inspirational ideas that we can take from the work of certain philosophers. For instance, Martha Nussbaum, who talks about the fragility of goodness. I think what we can learn from that is a view of humanist spirituality as always acknowledging the fragility of goodness. So even when we think about ultimate goodness, goodness that makes sense in limited situations, even that kind of goodness is always fragile and needs cultivating, cultivating, etc. And then uh, the work by Emmanuel Levinas, who was a strong critic, <laughs> who did a lot of critique on humanism, but gave us the notion of the humanism of the other, who says, well, spirituality can be understood as this small act that arises in the encounter with the other, the other with a capital O, something we cannot control, we cannot organize this spirituality, but sometimes this part just arises in the encounter with the other. Um, so two inspirations for understanding a notion of ultimate goodness that even makes sense in limited situations. In order to understand uh, humanist transcendence and humanist faith, I turn to, oh, I put up Levinas there. Levinas should not be here. Iris Murdoch and Hannah Arendt. So Iris Murdoch writes a lot about the Irish philosopher, writes a lot about transcendence uh, in a sense where she draws inspiration from religious notions of transcendence, but gives it a very anthropological um, coloring, I would say. So Iris Murdoch says, what is the importance in transcendence is that we transcend our selfishness, our selfish inclinations, by always again lovingly and compassionately looking at reality. So where transcendence is often seen as a sort of upward motion, in Murdoch's terms, it's a very horizontal or even downward motion or movement of moving towards others and towards the world. So that would be a kind of humanist transcendence I would support very much. And humanist faith, we could turn to the work by Hannah Arendt who talks about natality, who says where people meet and where people show interest in each other, something new may happen. And she talks about this in terms of a miracle may happen. And she also uses the terms faith and hope. And I guess this is, again, a notion of faith that connects us to many other worldviews who also think about faith. And it's important for spiritual caregivers to know your own sources of faith. And I guess for many humanists, this would be a source of faith. Something unexpected can happen where we meet. Um, finally, lastly, I think I'm also out of time, so I'll hurry and do this quickly. Um, so now, if we look at um, counseling and the world of counseling and the world of, world of therapy, because that was also one of the questions, how can we draw from these domains of counseling and therapy? I will just, I just throw down a few small clues which show, I think, that um, certain counseling practices or approaches to therapy can be very well understood in terms of uh, endorsing humanist spirituality. 
So the foundation of counseling is generally seen as solidly humanistic. And then uh, the second bullet point, uh, the work by Mick Cooper, who says that, well, welcoming the other, referring to the work by Levinas, expresses the humanistic value base in counseling. So I think you can see counseling as a deeply spiritual practice, which is about encountering and welcoming the otherness of the other. Obviously, Carl Rogers' relational approach, his emphasis on empathy, I think has a very spiritual ring to it. Um, focusing, a practice some of you might know, originated by Eugene Gentlin, which has to do with cultivating inner space, can seen as a practice of acknowledging the vulnerability there is, but still finding some space to live with vulnerability. And the last bullet point I put up that's really important to me is that always, again, we can critically look at this notion of welcoming the other. I mean, it sounds great, but as uh, um, part of this notion of humanist spirituality is always the critical question, how are certain others or groups of others marginalized or silenced? And with respect to this question, we may draw from many of the critical approaches to therapy which are around, like feminist therapy and queer therapy and decolonial therapy. And I would say these are very important approaches uh, from the perspective of humanist spirituality. So to also look at how may we ourselves as practitioners be part of dehumanizing practices. Um, my last sheet is just a bit of further Oh no, oh, I just want to give you the quote. Uh, this is really something that I find important. I wrote it down in the paper on the right about humanist chaplaincy. If we look at the future of chaplaincy and spiritual care, what unites all of us, whether we are religious or non-religious, is much more important, I would say, than what divides us. And we should focus on that like we are doing in these days. I, I find that so beautiful. And a bit of further reading here, uh, especially very soon a book at Route, which is coming out about chaplaincy in the post-secular world, um, addressing the humanistic perspectives in that, but meant for all kinds of spiritual caregivers. I think I need to leave it at that. I hope that was short enough. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Carmen, for uh, giving us a take uh, on your view of uh, humanism. And uh, also thank you for your openness uh, to uh, look at humanism critically, uh, because uh, if not, and I, uh, we uh, humanism would not be a wisdom tradition. Uh, so that that is very uh, and uh, also your focus on vulnerability, also related to goodness, is something that uh, sticked. And this critical approaches will certainly will also be picked up by Anthony in the third uh, talk. Uh, but we now go uh, to uh, James, uh, who will uh, give us his take on uh, humanist spiritual care in the UK. Go ahead, James. Thank you so much, Carmen. That was fantastic. I really appreciated it. I want to begin with a story. I arrived at the University of Sussex in February of last year, at which point I became the first and still the only humanist to lead a university's chaplaincy in the United Kingdom. Here in the UK, we have one national professional body for university chaplains. It's called the Churches Higher Education Liaison Group. And as the name suggests, it's an ecumenical Christian organization which does welcome non-Christians to its programs, but which, according to its website, is focused on supporting Christian ministry in higher education. And I, being new to the university sector in the UK and wanting to meet some colleagues, decided that I would attend and I was kindly asked to give a presentation on how university chaplaincies might support humanist staff and students. And it was a thought provoking and refreshing weekend. I met many talented colleagues and attended many excellent presentations. But one particular interaction sticks in my mind. 
I was walking from one session to another with a Christian chaplain from another institution I had only recently met. And he asked me a question I have frequently been asked since I started serving the University of Sussex community. How can you, a humanist and an atheist, provide pastoral care to students who believe in God? I answered with my now customary response, trading his question for one of my own. How can you, a theist, provide pastoral care to students who do not believe in God? In my experience, very few theistic spiritual caregivers have ever been asked that question, and they're often stumped by it. But my new friend and colleague had an answer. Well, he said, religious students have all the same needs as non-religious students, and then they have religious needs as well. Non-religious students, on the other hand, only have non-religious needs. So if I can serve the first group, I can serve the second. As a humanist who's worked in interfaith spaces for more than 15 years now, I often hear similar sentiments. And at the risk of overinterpreting my colleague's casual remarks, he seems to me to have a sort of model of spiritual care in mind. And perhaps it looks something like this. So here we see that everybody has non-religious needs. Only religious people have religious needs. Religious caregivers can respond to both types of need. Non-religious caregivers like me maybe can only respond to the non-religious needs. Now, with the greatest respect to my colleague, I think this model is entirely wrong because, well, lots of reasons, but partly because it views religious beliefs as additional to, on top of, the rest of one's life and commitments, a sort of optional extra, an upgrade module, which some people choose to install and others do not. And that, I think, misrepresents how deep religious and metaphysical commitments shape our approach to the whole of life. But it's also wrong because it implies that there can be nothing distinctive about a humanist approach to spiritual care. If spiritual care for non-theists is just the same as spiritual care for theists, but without the theistic bits, then there's nothing special about it. Anyone can do it as long as they can provide pastoral care to believers. And I think this is a mistake because I think there are distinctively humanist approaches to spiritual care. And that is what my presentation today is about. Now, recognizing this is especially important in my context, UK higher education, because students with broadly humanistic value sets are profoundly underserved right now. And while I don't know much about the context in many other countries, I know the same is true in the United States, and I strongly suspect it is true elsewhere. While I don't have time to go through all the data with you, According to recent research, the UK population has a lower bound of about 5% humanists and an upper bound of about 22%. And because students tend to be younger than the general population, the percentage of broadly humanist students at our universities could even be higher than the percentage for the whole population. So if we are to go with a estimate towards the lower end of that range and say that maybe five to 10% of UK university students are broadly speaking humanists, then that would make them a very large proportion, demographically speaking, of all students. If we compare that to other student religious populations, looking at this data from Advanced Higher Education Religion and Belief Report from 2020, that would mean that our humanist student population is more than 10 times the size of our Jewish student population, five times the size of the Sikh student population, and about the same or perhaps slightly larger than the Muslim student population. 
And yet, here in the UK, there are hardly any humanist chaplains in our universities. This report from 2019 showed that there were at the time only 16 humanist chaplains in all our universities in the whole country, which makes 1.6% of the total. And that makes humanists one of the most underserved worldview demographics in UK higher education. And I'm sure the same is true in many other countries too. This fact came home to me starkly in the workshop I presented at that conference when I asked the chaplains present, what programs does your university offer specifically to cater for the needs of your humanist students? Would you like to see their collected responses? This is the slide. Now, why does this happen? Why is one of the single largest and fastest growing worldview demographics so consistently underrepresented in chaplaincies and other venues of spiritual care? And why do existing caregivers give so little targeted thought to the peculiar needs of that demographic? There are many reasons, but I'm sure part of the reason is that even many practitioners in the spiritual care space have no well-developed understanding of what humanism is and what distinctly humanist spiritual care might look like. And helping focus some initial ideas is what the rest of my presentation is about. I think we should begin with the recognition that, as Carmen said, humanism is a distinct worldview tradition. It's not quite the same as many religious traditions, to be sure, but it is an integrated set of normative commitments with its own intellectual, practical, and political history. While I don't call humanism a religion, I do like British philosopher Harry Stopes Rose term, life stance, he writes, the style and content of an individual's or community's relationship with that which is of ultimate importance, the presuppositions of this, and the consequences for life that flow from it. That's what he calls a life stance. And I think humanism can be characterized this way. It might seem a very simple point. Humanism is a life stance, especially for people who attend meetings like this one. But the fact is that in the religiocentric and theocentric societies many of us inhabit, I personally would strongly debate the idea that we're in a post-secular society. I don't think we've even got to a secular one yet. It's often implicitly assumed that non-religious people don't have a distinctive worldview. Think of the terms used to describe this population, non-religious, atheists, and my least favorite sociological term ever, the nuns. This slide makes me shudder because all those terms reinforce the idea that to be non-religious is to be a nothing a cipher with no positive framework of beliefs. Indeed, I had an amusing encounter with that way of thinking shortly after I was appointed at Sussex. Because I was the first humanist to take up such a position, there was some media interest, and the Times of London wrote an article about me, complete with the most unflattering photograph you could imagine. And shortly after that, a letter appeared in the newspaper's pages. And here is that letter written by one Edward Reed of London, who is not amused by my appointment. I hope Edward is not here today, but if you are, apologies. Sir, I cannot be alone in finding it deeply ironic that the humanist James Croft at Sussex University, who admits to no discernible beliefs against the backdrop of a society with its foundation in Christian philosophy, is content to accept a post as a chaplain. Well, yes, Edward, I was content to accept the post. Sorry, not sorry. But notice the words Reed uses here. 
admits to no discernible beliefs. But that's not true. I have discernible beliefs, and I think they are as credible and respectable as those of any religious tradition. And recognizing that humanists actually do have distinctive positive beliefs, and that those beliefs form a worldview, a wisdom tradition, or a life stance, is the first step toward developing a humanist understanding of spiritual care. The second step then is to try to characterize the central aspects of that life stance in greater detail. Many philosophers have done this. Kalman just did it. I am going to pre present my own attempt today, but there are many different versions, but they all have similarities. I personally like to view humanism as a complex of six interrelated normative commitments, truth, nature, community, growth, goodness, and justice. I could say a lot about each of those things, but the sake of time, I won't do that. I'll just give a very brief rundown of each of them. And here I'm drawing on my own chapter in the Oxford Handbook of Humanism, and all the quotes are taken from humanism and its aspirations, which is sometimes called the Third Humanist Manifesto. So truth or the epistemic commitment the Third Humanist Manifesto says that humanists believe that knowledge of the world is derived by observation, experimentation, and rational analysis. So humanists are committed to rational observation and analysis of the world in the pursuit of truth and to revising our beliefs as new evidence and reasons present themselves. Nature, or the naturalist commitment, the idea that humans are integral parts of nature, the result of unguided evolutionary change. We are one animal among others with no special metaphysical significance. We are all related to every piece of life on this planet. And this commitment is particularly important because it's quite distinctive among comprehensive worldviews because it includes humanist tendency to embrace philosophical naturalism and hence non-theism and also the humanist belief that this is our only life and there's no afterlife awaiting us. And I'll say a bit about the spiritual care component of that belief in a second. Community. Humans are social by nature and find meaning in relationships, what we might call the social commitment of humanism. Humanism expresses the importance of social life and our relationships with other people. Growth, life's fulfillment emerges from individual participation in the service of humane ideals. I call this the self-actualization commitment, the idea that human life is best lived if we are constantly seeking to learn and grow, to expand our powers and qualities in such a way as is consistent with the other principles and enhances our own life. Goodness. Ethical values are derived from human need and interest as tested by experience, the ethical commitment of humanism, the view that all human beings have dignity and worth, that actions should be judged by how they promote that dignity and worth, and not by abstract or extra human considerations. And finally, justice, working to benefit society maximizes individual happiness we seek to minimize the inequities of circumstance and ability and we support a just distribution of nature's resources and the fruits of human effort what we might just call the justice commitment our responsibility to create a world in which the dignity and worth of all people is respected so if it's fair to call these six commitments or something like them the normative pillars of humanism then I think we can see that we are dealing with a distinct life stance here. It's certainly true, as Carmen rightly mentioned, that many traditions might lay claim, do lay claim, to some or even all of the same commitments in a broad sense. I'm not claiming that any of these are unique to humanism. But when you put them all together and understand them in something like the way I've described, then you have something that at least in some key respects looks quite different 
to how many other traditions, particularly religious traditions, understand the world. And this has profound consequences for spiritual caregivers. First, because to serve a population of humanists, you need at least to understand and ideally be able to imaginatively inhabit an experience of the world shaped by these commitments, especially what I've called the naturalist commitment, an experience of life which views our existence here as temporary and not followed by anything else, has dramatically different contours to one which views our life as at least potentially infinite. Here I'm reminded of humanist philosopher Martin Hegland, who in his book, This Life, makes a distinction between what he calls religious and secular faith. He writes, the sense of finitude, the sense of the ultimate fragility of everything we care about, is at the heart of what I call secular faith. To have secular faith is to be devoted to a life that will end, to be dedicated to projects that can fail or break down. I personally don't love his use of the word faith here, but I do like the distinction he is drawing. While some forms of living frame our commitments to this world in light of some expected world to come, whether through reincarnation or continued existence in heaven, etc., Humanism does not. Humanism says this is it. And providing care for someone who believes that this is it is not, despite what my colleague I mentioned at the beginning thought, just like providing care for someone who is religious, but without the religious bits. You actually have to reorient yourself to a different worldview. You have to imaginatively shift your life stance. Second, understanding humanism as a life stance has implications for those of us who offer spiritual care. It makes sense of the notion that there's a distinctly humanist way to be a spiritual caregiver. To put it simply, to give care in a way which respects the commitments I mentioned. Now, I'm not saying that I go into a pastoral care encounter with like a checklist of these six things and go through them each time. But when I examine my pastoral encounters, I do think I am trying to embody each of them. So by appreciating humanism as a genuine life stance, I think we can enrich our understanding of how to spiritually serve humanists and how, if we are humanists ourselves, we can practice our vocation in a humanistic way. One final consideration We've been asked to address how spiritual caregivers might integrate insights from the social and behavioral sciences. And I think humanism is quite interesting from this perspective. Let's go back to that truth commitment. Humanism as a life stance is intriguing because it's basically folded the fundamental epistemic commitments of science into its worldview. Humanists do not claim, this is a common mistake, that science is the only route to truth. But what we do tend to say is that science is an exemplification of particularly valuable epistemic practices, and that ideally all our epistemic pursuits could be improved by incorporating some of those practices. And for this reason, there should be no problem with humanistic spiritual caregivers incorporating insights from the social and behavioral sciences, and indeed many of the luminaries of those fields were themselves humanists, including, of course, the humanistic psychologists whose work informs so much psychological science to this day. So to conclude, I think my chaplain friend was wrong when he said that caring for the spiritual needs of humanists is essentially the same as caring for the needs of religious people without the added religious layer. Rather, humanism offers a distinctive approach to life that spiritual caregivers should seek to understand, especially given the large numbers of people who today hold broadly humanistic beliefs. The humanist life stance is as worthy of serious consideration and respect as all the great wisdom traditions of the world and is not simply the absence of beliefs, despite what Mr. Edward Reed of London may have thought. Thank you very much for your time.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, James, uh, for your, um, well, uh, for, for your provocative, very well uh, eloquent uh, perspective uh, and um, a lot uh, to think about. Um, what I take away from it is that uh, from a humanist perspective that you your plea is to really respect it uh, as uh, within the spiritual care field as a distinctive approach uh, that deserves uh, to be respected uh, as uh, its uh, own worldview that uh, differentiates uh, from other uh, wisdom uh, traditions. It is a live uh, stance. And you referred uh, to what you called the magic of humanism and your humanistic interpretation of concepts like truth, nature, community, growth, goodness, and justice. And um, what I took away from, uh, from it is that you want to practice your vocation in a humanist way and that you refuse to be qualified as a nun. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for uh, this perspective uh, and uh, I'm very happy uh, to uh, refer now uh, to Anthony uh, who uh, will bring an extra layer uh, to uh, our focus on humanist traditions and I need to stress that uh, the International Association of Spiritual Care thought that it is extremely important to give enough time uh, to uh, the humanist uh, traditions so that we can um, that we can appreciate uh, the the perspective uh, of our colleagues who situate uh, themselves within this tradition so I'm now happy to give the floor to Anthony thank you so much let's see Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, as it was stated in the beginning, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I am delighted to be in this space. Um, I am speaking from the unceded land of the Wampanoag and the Massachusetts people here in Medford, Massachusetts, in my house. Um, as a point of statement, everything that I'm sharing here is of my own reflection and scholarship. It does not necessarily represent um, the ideas, ideologies, um, or stances of my employers, nor the associations or communities that I serve and work alongside. My presentation today is titled Inner and Outer Worlds, Caring for Self and Others. I apologize that I don't have a credit for that picture. Um, however, this picture really represents at least where I find myself, um, both personally, professionally, um, and in my own praxis and philosophical stances around the complexities of how do we navigate our own realities innerly, utterly, and in relationality. Um, and I find that art um, in its most capacious ways is one of the ways that um, help translate or present or transmit ideas through and across difference, proximity, and languages and cultures. Um, I always like to begin my presentations, um, oh, sorry, basically talking about um, position. I'm, I'm sorry, Anthony, could you yep. make your full screen? Uh, we see uh, now that you are uh, the next slide in the comments and so on. Is, would it be possible to make a full screen? It, it's full screen on my end. Did it shift? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I take the flow away, but there is some text that that is maybe then too little to to read. Okay, apologies. Yeah, would think after uh, years of training, people. <laughs> I would yeah, have we are mastered. almost there, and then from where you are. Okay, uh, let me show let me try again. Where... Yeah, I'll take it out and go again. Would be a pity that we missed something out of it.
and then play from the start, I think. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, now we are there. Great, thank you. Oh, sorry, hold on. Because if I do it in that way, I won't be able to see my notes. Sorry, folks. I'll try one more time. If it's not possible, uh, it's okay. Just give it another try, indeed. There? Yeah, it, uh, we are back from where we started, but it's okay. Yeah. Uh, we will not uh, that good? continue. Yeah, okay, thank you. So are we seeing positionality? Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, starting with positionality, and I always do this because I like to, in a way, melt away um, at times the divide between practitioner, scholars, and or um, instructor and audience, communities and leadership and so forth as a way of connecting and allowing the personal and the experiential to enter into our spaces. Um, when I think about positionality, I'm thinking of, and not in a reductionist way, but at least in two frameworks. One is thinking about who am I in this point in time or snapshot? And then what are the tradition, philosophies, academic um, traditions that inform my own work? And so I situate myself as an Afro-Caribbean first generation in the in-between of being low income, neurodivergent and a non-linear thinker and processor. Academically, I position myself as a, as a transdisciplinary scholar, practitioner, activist, someone situated within the cultural studies, decolonial thought, spirituality, and civics. Um, and I mentioned this because this does center around my own considerations of how do we navigate um, cultural work? How do we move between being, in my case, right, an educator, curator, and community activist with notions around um, the, the work of decolonizing or the decolonial and our social imaginaries, and how specifically, as practitioners, scholars, and those in between, do we actually begin to unapologetically confront our histories, our legacies, notions around racial capitalism, and specifically um, what pertains to this talk, how do we navigate a form of humanism that is cultivated through assembling insights from various um, religious, spiritual, wisdom traditions? And then how is that then viewed by our own perspectives? In my case, hailing from the global South, situated in the global North, and how do we better then understand our human condition, our responsibilities, and some might say obligation in how we are cultivating, um, as Jay mentioned, our life stands, as Carmen mentioned, our worldviews, um, and or our practice of humanism. And so specifically looking at then our positionality as something that's implicating us in any of the work, scholarship, and relationalities that we cultivate and do, and thus then affecting every facet of our lives, specifically when we are navigating both questions, problems, constructing, designing, and conducting work, what pertains at least to the realm of spiritual care, communal care, and so forth. Um, I would love then to center um, my talk around one quote, um, and this is just as a way of entry point, um, and it has to do with the um, work of um, Caribbean philosopher Sylvia Winter, and the quote states, that which we have made, we can unmake, then consciously now remake. This quote for me Contextualizing it represents my own emergence out of the um, Spanish-speaking Caribbean and thinking about 
at least three um, axes, if you will, in my life. And at that time, I'm thinking about my youth, <laughs> um, undergraduate years, and thinking around the dimensions of translation, the diasporic, and the embodiment and theorizing in the context, at least, of being in Puerto Rico at that time. And both how I process that individually as we process that as communities or societies and the relationship again between um, the Caribbean in a colonial reality and of course um, the global the global north or in that case um, North America the US right and I mentioned this because this serves as a foundation of how I envision um, what I called in a course that I taught last year the practice of being human humanism for everyday life, which really examines the possibilities of how can humanisms take seriously a commitment to capacious and emancipatory relationalities? How do we look at a humanism that's looking across histories, practices, geographies, and platforms? And by platforms, I mean the digital technological world that of course are intertwined into our realities right now, regardless of where you are in the globe. And specifically looking then um, at the development of vocation. And I bring this concept um, because that's how my orientation to humanism emerged. I was situated at La Universidad Interamericana de Puerto Rico, pursuing my undergrad degree in social sciences and anthropology. Um, and, and this connects to the notion of histories, right? And how specifically this institution, which was founded in 1912 under the auspices of the United Presbyterian Church of the United States, um, and I quote, was founded to present day, um, sorry, from its founding days to the present day, it has maintained a firm commitment to chaplaincy as an essential activity for the integral formation of its students. I did not know that history when I was a student. Um, and I always joke and say, I never got to meet the chaplain when I was a student. However, the understanding that as an institution within the Caribbean, navigating the works of what does it mean to take seriously the work of the development and cultivation of the human condition and human experience, even though at the time and still today through a predominantly a Christian lens, taking seriously the endeavors of looking at the whole human condition and really doing the work of interdisciplinary frameworks around the life of social realities, the academic and the spiritual or what I would call existential. And how then does that look like in terms of, as I mentioned before, the realities of translation, the diasporic um, or colonial in, in that sense, and then the embodiments that we are navigating as students in that dimension. Now, what pertains at least to this talk, and I'll move um, fairly quickly, is that during my studies um, at Universidad Interamericana, in 2014, so close to a decade ago, I actually took a course um, with, with Dr. Um, Jesus Rodriguez. Um, and basically I was exposed to a book that he, and, um, that he actually published um, in 2012 called Encuentros Pastorales con Documentos Humanos Vivientes Ante la Muerte. Um, and this text was life-changing for me because it really allowed for me to really begin to see um, the work of Anton T. Boysen and his definition around, quote, reading the living human documents, um, which is a necessary supplement to the um, classroom training and the seminary experience as Anton Boysen states um, in some of his traditional um, work. And this is important because it allowed for me to be able to visualize and see that higher ed chaplaincy work was a possibility. At the same time, it allowed for me to understand 
that the emergence of a vocation is multivalent, that is cultivated through diverse cartographies and landscapes, how we're sensing and experiencing, which then unveil connections of evolving rhythms, weaving meaning into the unfolding stories of our life. And I find that this dance of exploration is what I would call a vocation. In other words, a journey that awakens us to the fullness of being. And that's more of a humanist orientation, which then moves us to my conceptual framework around theory of action for chaplaincy, um, what I titled alongside um, my colleague, Dr. Justin Jimenez, um, as the intersubjective encountered and relational field. And this is specifically important or relevant because it's really centering my own framework around Afro-Caribbean and humanist um, care, around the specifically the notion of existential care. How do we center, as we look here in the actual center, a DRT that exploring um, the self? on a Morbius strip. And that's not my original concept. The Morbius strip is um, by um, Palmer specifically. And I'm using this symbol because I think that it really delucidates, right? That it's a multi-side um, understanding of how do we navigate knowledge, identity, and embodiment? How is that then interconnected, and you can barely see it, and my apologies, but the circular that actually um, has dots, right? And that's being very intentional around understanding that the whole world itself possibly is porous. And how do we then begin to do the relational field of taking into account the pluriversal inquiry, critical ethic of care and responsibility, reckoning with notions around the colonial and modernity, and specifically um, the, the notion of curlization. And these are all, um, and similar to what James actually presented in his own framing, these are just frameworks that are holding either the praxis, the containers, the encounters, um, or the intersubjective encounters that one is having um, with directees. And I present this at least in two dimensions and I'll hopefully expand very quickly later on, both in the context of higher ed chaplaincy, as well as within the notion of clinical context. Um, and I've had, had the opportunity of actually being in both. And I find that this is specifically very salient in the notion of how do we then begin to hold this conceptual framework, not as a universal framework, because I'm literally just presenting it, um, but literally as a way of potentially holding this in relationship to the field of chaplaincy, again, both in um, and across traditions, philosophies, and other frameworks that, of course, precede this one. And I will, of course, begin to um, unpack some of these notions, okay? So I began by defining um, my chaplaincy orientation. Um, I define chaplaincy or chaplain in this case as a clinician or professional with expertise in existential care. Someone that's entrusted by an institution and its constituency to radically and deeply listen to the inner movements and threads of meaning within a person's life. And through a process of mutuality, reflect and challenge towards an everyday practice of holding worlds within worlds. This is specifically very salient for me because it really elucidates the understanding that within this capacious definition, we're holding a secular worldview or a secular orientation, which is unmediated by a higher power. However, it does center a constructivist naturalistic inquiry and empirically based practices. Um, specifically as humanists, how we consider the capacities and capabilities um, of human beings to center um, a more ethical, empathetic, and interdependent relations and worlds. 
and eliciting the fullness of the human experience as we do the work of uh, being aware of our own selves as care providers, aware of who's in the space and in whose institutions are we moving, and specifically how are we holding this dimension of relationality across all of these systems in which we are operating. And specifically, how are we paying attention to how all of these are navigating in terms of their own understanding of selves, of the own understanding of institutions, the own understanding of even the departments of chaplaincy and spiritual care, and how do we allow for a capacious understanding of holding, again, worlds within worlds, meaning that we do not stop being who we are when we enter specific thresholds of institutions, but that we're actually holding a multiplicity of beings. And so then if we considered humanism, or as I'm stating here, humanisms as pluriversality, holding a decolonial, interrelational, and embodied embodied praxis, then we can potentially consider that, as I'm defining here, humanism can be considered a continued praxis that's con connecting the theories of everyday life with meaningful practice. One of my questions, how do we be together? And how are we holding the complexities and challenges and possibilities of culture, power, spirituality, um, specifically connecting it to today's talk, right? The inner life as it informs the outer and holding an ethical framework that's expansive. And thus, um, as we're seeing here with Ali Dayan Erzbrom, um, defining specifically, quote, a pluriversal approach, which suggests multiple ways of existing, speaking, writing, making knowledge, and creating aesthetics forms. This notion of the colonial pluriversalism means situating and historicizing these forms in the context of power relations, processes and genealogies that condition them and make them possible. Again, really reinforcing this framework that I'm presenting um, of the intersubjective, intersubjective encounter. How are we holding all of these multiplicities of being and forms in a way of affirming, um, of empowering specifically. And then um, as Jackson states, centering this notion of quote, being human, that it's not about attributes or capacities, nor is it a goal to be attained, rather it's an ongoing process of becoming, a becoming that is always already entangled with the material world and with other beings. It is through this process of entanglement that we come to know ourselves and the world around us. So really, again, centering what my colleague Carmen mentioned earlier on around, yes, there are critiques around what is humanism, how is humanism defined, how is it practiced, and what are the assumptions, pre prejudices, and biases that we hold. And yet, humanisms holding the possibilities of the work and ongoing work and challenge of relationality as a way of centering the self. And then specifically, how has humanist chaplains, do we begin to transgress forms of thinking and being in ways that are necessary, both for ourselves, but for the practices that we hold in a way by challenging the dialogues and visions and world makings that are life-giving and specifically sustaining? And how as humanist chaplains do we evince the possibilities to inquire about the human condition by plumbing into the complexities of power and interrelatedness in the here and now? And at the same time, really holding this understanding of the gender of the human and who has been able to be rendered human. And in this way, humanist chaplaincy can make a salient praxis of knowledge and experience of other worlds at the same time. For the sake of time, I'm just gonna move on. Um, specifically, again, um, bringing back again, the world system that I presented, the 
in this case is circular and closed just for the sake of the of this presentation but in the prior slides as you saw it was more porous and thinking about relationality and how does relationality provide a space for critical inquiry and political action how does it both reveal a global and systemic dimension um, as i was stated um, previously by other colleagues really centering the racialized, sexualized, and gender subjugation, um, as Alexander Wahili is stating here, and at the same time, not losing sight of the many political violence um, which have given rise to ongoing practices of freedom within various traditions of the oppressed. So again, um, bringing both a global South orientation, bringing a global North or a Western understanding, and as a way of connection saying, what are the possibilities of relationships that can then give emergence to politics of life in a way of complicating systems, patterns, and allowing for the multiplicity of relationality to enact our interactions and centering this notion, um, as Adrian Murray Brown is stating here, of connections, authentic relationships, and again, listening with the body and the mind. Um, I'll quickly just mention that, again, in terms of the notions of care and responsibility, I'm informed by Puig de la Bella Casa, Tronto and Fisher and others, and really specifically thinking around how do we maintain and continue to repair the world? Um, so that all, as I'm saying here, quote, rather than we can live in it, um, in it as well as possible, a complex life-sustaining web. And that for me, again, is really expanding the framework that I presented um, earlier and really thinking around specifically our response ability. How are we nurturing the ethical sensibilities um, and the sensibilities to respond? Again, this dynamic, right? Um, and specifically then how, how do we apprehend different forms of responses? So again, really, challenging the notion of a universal framework and more around one that's relational and cutting across. Um, and how do we do then ethics in a way that's ongoing, collaborative, um, and always as speculative um, in terms of meditation that then allows for some dimension of flourishing and how can we then imagine otherwise? Um, and then I'll quickly just present um, curlization. For me, it's a dynamic unsettling of the cohesion of identity and culture towards the dynamic recognition of power, um, which influences um, and how our experiences are interpolated in continuous processes that center agency and subjectivities from the periphery and enlivened by these other perspectives of the interrelational, the embodied, and the colonial. Um, and then lastly, since I know I'm, I'm running out of time, um, just wanna center the notion that I'm holding as, as a humanist chaplain, again, hailing from the global south and situated in the global north, the realities around um, the coloniality and modernity. Um, and here I'm, I'm quoting Quijano that states that coloniality is one of the constitutive and specific elements of the global pattern of capitalist power. It is based on the imposition of a racial ethnic classification of the world's population as the cornerstone of this power pattern. And, it's operate, and it operates in every sphere, area and dimension, both material and subjective of everyday social existence and social scale. Very important and salient in the terms of um, humanist chaplaincy, chaplaincy and spiritual care as a whole, as a profession, as an association. How are we holding um, this dimension of coloniality and modernity? Um, can someone tell me how much time I have or if I'm way over? And I'll present the case maybe on the break. Um, let's say another two minutes. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, again, here I am presenting a case um, of Mehmet, um, who is actually in the context of higher ed. Um, and specifically here, I am just presenting a way in which how as a humanist chaplain, I was able to provide care to this student, um, specifically centering the notion around how the student was navigating the complexities of boundaries, friendship, and personal meaning making. And specifically, 
how do we then recognize um, creating experiences and spaces where we are honoring and welcoming um, a practice of care? How do we then center the cultural funds of knowledge as normative and affirmed? Again, specifically the student um, coming from a Southwestern wisdom tradition. So not historically represented in the context of higher ed chaplaincy specifically. And how do we then, for example, entertain the possibilities? And here I'm quoting uh, my former professor Rodriguez once again, um, and specifically, and I'm translating, holding the interwoven in these narrative forms. It's not only my voice as a clinical pastoral theologian, but the voices of those whom we seek to represent. And so in a way, recognizing that even though as a humanist chaplain, I hold a different life stance to those that I might be potentially providing care, in a way, we are also reflecting or mirroring different dimensions of ourselves, of our traditions, of our wisdoms and ethical frameworks. And so how do we then utilize power and platform in order to be able to allow for the extensiating of those that are seeking care? Looking forward to maybe expanding a bit more um, on this actual very extensive verbatim during our break. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anthony. Uh, I was in a way uh, uh, very much moved by your presentation uh, because I experience I come from a from a Christian uh, tradition and I experienced this as a kind of vocational story uh, in which you uh, explain to us that from the humanist tradition there is this need uh, and uh, internal drive uh, to um, to integrate uh, chaplaincy uh, in this tradition. Uh, and um, so because uh, the humanist tradition is a kind of inquiry, uh, which uh, almost from itself invites uh, a, a relational care, uh, and uh, that you discovered uh, during your studies, this moment uh, that you refer to, that you I can also become a chaplain. Um, and uh, within a, a Christian institution uh, that you discovered, that, which had its own roots. So that was very moving for me, because uh, this is all why we take time also to, to, uh, to go to a symposium like this one, is that we have all had this inner drive based on our own tradition uh, to do this kind of work. Um, your... your um, mm, Personality in uh, using uh, the uh, English language was overwhelming for me as a non-native uh, speaker. So it was um, a joy uh, to listen to the way that you play with words and, and in, in, in that way also kind of represent what a humanist uh, tr a traditional uh, and re uh, humanist thinking can be. Uh, words like uh, pluriversality, uh, but also other words that are more familiar to me, like uh, the diaspora uh, and the positionality uh, and uh, the complexities of power uh, and uh, the uh, policies of life. So you, you, you have a very rich uh, framework uh, that um, invites to get more explored uh, and uh, delved into. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing uh, your uh, your position, like you said, coming from the global south, working in the global north, and situating yourself within this humanist tradition that has Western roots, but uh, with your global uh, south orientation. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, so I think we got uh, three uh, very intriguing um perspectives uh, of uh, on humanist uh, care. Um, if you want uh, to look at the case study, we have the invitation from Anthony. Uh, that can be done now in the next uh, 25 uh, minutes. So you can have then the choice to join the group uh, of Anthony, I think. Uh, and uh, so we will go now uh, back into 
um, uh, smaller groups. And a question that I take away is a question that is maybe uh, behind uh, the symposium is that the tradition of chaplaincy, also the word, comes from the Christian tradition and how we uh, as uh, people from different traditions can support each other also, being aware, me as a Christian chaplain or, or uh, educator, that I have always been in a kind of privileged uh, uh, position. And what does that mean uh, in our cooperation with other traditions? Uh, and being aware of our own positionality. Uh, and that is something enriching that, that I have taken uh, from uh, this uh, three talks. So I give you uh, now time to go into uh, the breakout groups, uh, take uh, also time uh, for uh, a little break, uh, but enjoy also the company of uh, colleagues that come from different traditions and worldviews uh, and different continents and different ages and so on, different positionalities. So enjoy, and we will see each other then um, local time uh, uh, at uh, 12. In European time, that would be 6 o'clock. Okay, uh, talk to you later. Do we have a set room we go to, or do we just kind of? I think Steve is placing us, right? Oh, okay. If, My bad. Yeah. If you want to go to a, a specific room, um, let me go ahead and place you in these rooms. Um, but what was it about the case study of Anthony? <laughs> I heard something. Yeah. About that. I I'm want to do the case study with Anthony. When right. <laughs> Do you yeah. have that case study um, available that I could I, put in the in the chat for people? Uh, I was just going to present it without the recording, just because it's a you know it's a verbatim and has specific details. But if you open up a room, um, yeah, I can just present it if people are interested. If not, I'm fine just chatting with folks. I mean, whichever. Uh, another option is maybe to write to everybody that Anthony stays in the main room. And oh, okay. uh, people who yeah. want to discuss with him uh, could go, come back to the main room, leave the, the small group and come back to the main room. That Thank you for simplifying it, <laughs> Dominic. And Everyone's just Everyone's going to come to you, Anthony. And just <laughs> stopping the recording for the sake of privacy in this space. Thanks so much. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, the breakout groups, they are uh, closing. People are getting back into the main room. By the way, Dominic, I do have a few minutes. I mean, I don't wanna power over the flow of our schedule, but since we are, I think, officially over, um, if as a presenter group, I have a few minutes to stay beyond if folks have specific questions. Don't want to speak okay. for my colleagues, but I'm willing to provide that space as well. Okay, so I will um, first, first do, is optional. <laughs> uh, yeah, first do like an uh, official. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, so we had our second day of our symposium. Yesterday, we had a very exciting um, view on different traditions, as uh, which were uh, Hinduism, Judaism, and indigenous wisdom traditions. Today, we had uh, Buddhism and humanism. Uh, and we have the luxury and the privilege uh, to have still another day tomorrow. Uh, which will be moderated by our colleague, uh, Lea Thomas. And uh, so I thank you all uh, for uh, joining us uh, today. 
Um, looking forward uh, to meet you all uh, tomorrow uh, for another exciting day in which uh, Christianity and Islam uh, will be in focus. Uh, and at the end of that session, we will also look a little bit into the future uh, as the association and uh, SIPCC as organizers uh, reflect on this symposium, hopefully together with, with you all. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, there is the offer if you still want to uh, discuss with the presenters, uh, some of them will stay in the room. Uh, if not, uh, you uh, wish you all uh, a wonderful afternoon, evening, or in where whatever time frame you live and think and position yourself. So see you tomorrow, uh, dear colleagues. Thank you very much. By the way, Carmen, so great to meet you. Um, yes, yeah, same here. So much for the work that you do um, and just presenting very briefly um, the history of um, the Humanistic University. Um, yeah, very inspiring. Yeah, same here. So really happy to meet you, Anthony. I think, uh, yeah, 